Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm just letting a few more people kind of jump on here and then we'll get rolling. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, again, thank you for joining us today um, for today's webinar. It's brought to you by Mix It Up. Uh, my name is Michelle Allison, and I'm the Associate Publisher of Top Crop Manager. And this is the second of three resistance management webinars that we're hosting. And today I'm joined by Adam Pfeffer, Row Crop Agronomic Systems Manager with Bayer. Uh, today during our session, Adam will discuss the history of herbicide resistance, managing glyphosate resistant weeds in corn and soybeans across Canada, including water hemp, Canada fleabane, and resistant kochia. And he'll advise on some resources you can use to help you manage these weeds as well. Uh, big special thanks to Mix It Up by Bayer Crop Science for sponsoring our session today. From seed to harvest, Bayer is focused on delivering top performing solutions to address some of your toughest farm challenges. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. This session is scheduled to run for approximately 45 minutes. Following Adam's presentation, we'll open up the floor for questions. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to type them into the questions tab found on the GoToWebinar panel on your computer screen. This webinar has also been approved for one CCA CEU credit in crop management. Um, further instruction for submissions will follow the presentation if you did not submit your CCA number when you registered for today's webinar. And without further ado, I will let Adam take it away. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully everybody's, uh... I guess comfortable in your home under these uh, uncertain times. Um, so yeah, the topic for today that I was asked to present on was just managing uh, resistant weeds in corn and soybeans and really focusing in on uh, glyphosate resistant weeds, something that we've been dealing with uh, depending on which part of the country you're in for quite a number of years now. Um, it's certainly not, uh, not a new topic, but just want to cover a few highlights for today. Um, See if I get my slides to advance here. There we go. Um, so as Michelle alluded to, I'll give a, a brief history of herbicide resistance globally and here in Canada. Um, I will focus in on kochia, fleabane, and water hemp and provide some comments uh, with regards to those three weeds in corn and soybeans and try and touch on a few different situations uh, across Canada and, and hopefully get some thought processes going uh, with everybody around managing of those weeds. I'll touch very briefly on what our future, current and future trait pipeline looks like um, on the soybean side, as well as a couple quick comments on corn. And then, yeah, review a couple resources that um, are available to growers, um, depending on which part of the country you're in, there's lots of resources you can reach out and, um, get in more information on how to deal with uh, managing uh, herbicide resistant weeds. Certainly not a new topic and one that we spend a lot of time talking about as an industry um, and it's uh, it's very difficult to I would say move the needle um, and get ahead of mother nature on this uh, on this front as we um, think about the different situations across Canada. So just a few slides here on kind of to frame up the whole conversation around resistance. And the first picture here I'll, I'll stop on is a, a picture I grabbed from Charles Getty's greenhouse in Lethbridge. Um, and he was screening uh, the current, I guess the, the last screen or provincial survey of uh, kochia in, uh, in Manitoba. And you can see a few of these populations certainly have um, quite a few survivors uh, in the screen. And you can see a few populations are quite clean. So it really, to me, speaks to the diversity that we have, uh, that we deal with in our fields uh, year in and year out in different areas. Um, and certainly the uh, the agronomic practices and, and management, um, level of management that each grower has on their operations uh, has a big uh, determining factor on, um, on what resistant weeds they're working with in their fields. 
Um, <clears throat> so a bit of background globally on global herbicide uh, resistance. This information is off of weedscience.org. It's a global archive where um, any academic or uh, industry person can post uh, information about resistant weeds um, and it's kind of tracked on a global uh, basis um, and tallied up but you can see certainly long history of uh, of resistance dating back um, to the 60s here in Ontario but certainly the 70s um, with atrazine a lot of over usage of, of trizines uh, when they were initially introduced you can see the group twos were introduced in the early 80s and they had a very rampant uptake of, uh, of resistance development globally in, in numerous species. Um, you can see the group ones and today's focus will be group nine or glyphosate, um, certainly starting, uh, I guess, around year 2000, um, late 90s, early 2000. You can see it's on, uh, on its trend upwards and you can see the other herbicide families here. So. Uh, group four, the oxen family, uh, group four, the PPO inhibitors, uh, group 27, HPPDs, um, you know, only a couple of cases there globally, but still uh, still on the tally. And in Canada, um, this data is current as of 2018. You can see we're at 76 unique biotypes uh, across the country and, uh, and continuing to climb. So again, herbicide resistance isn't new. Um, you know, anytime we overutilize a single mode of action, we're we're gonna lead ourselves into trouble with uh, with weed resistance development. And you know, years back when triazine or atrazine was first used in corn, um, you know, when one pound stopped working, growers went to two and and kind of ratcheted up the use rates, and eventually that didn't work. And and group twos, um, once they were introduced, a lot of usage in soybeans because they were very effective. Um, but uh, again, overutilized single modes of action and, and mother nature uh, adapted quite uh, quite readily. And then you can see broken down by province, obviously the, the heavier or more intense the egg um, is in each province, uh, really relates to the amount of weeds, uh, unique biotypes that are resistant uh, within each province. So my home province here of Ontario, certainly leading the way, um, Manitoba in a close second and Alberta and Saskatchewan and then followed by Quebec. So um, again, this is that as current as 20 as of 2018. Um, certainly, there has been a few additions to the list uh, since then, um, as there there always will be. So, um, but again, fairly current uh, information there. And really, when um, herbicide resistance becomes the most challenging to deal with is when we start layering in uh, multiple. Um, resistances within the same species. So you can see here, um, you know, two modes of action quite prevalent, three, four, five, six, um, and even seven down here at the very bottom. There is now documented cases of uh, water hemp and palmer uh, in the US um, resistant to six and seven different modes of action. And when you start thinking about that and the challenges that that can lead to, um, and how many options that growers uh, do not have access to anymore. It, it certainly becomes quite a challenge and we certainly have to think outside the box. Um, I'll touch on a few points uh, in my conclusions, but just around uh, integrated weed management, crop rotations, um, you know, cover crops and a few other things that I think we need to start thinking about uh, as these populations become more challenging to, uh, to manage with the use of herbicides alone. And really uh, another aspect of the whole herbicide industry is it's very difficult to um, to develop and launch a new mode of action. And, and really what I've done here is shown a timeline of uh, the major herbicide modes of action here uh, globally and, and when they were introduced. And I highlighted a few with red circles here just to really show uh, kind of the timeline. So our synthetic oxen are group four, uh, Fluxapir, 2,4-D, Dicamba, you know, that herbicide the family was uh, discovered back in the 40s. Our atrazines, photosystem 2 inhibitors, group 5s in the mid 50s, group 15s in the 60s, uh, PPO uh, again late 60s. Um, you can see here glyphosate or group 9 roundup back in the early 70s. Group 1s, 2s, and uh, the latest one that is really prevalent in our herbicide uh, systems here in Canada, group 27s, was initially discovered in the early 80s and that's um you know that's i guess my vintage around 35 years ago so 
we haven't um, seen a new novel mode of action um, launched in the in globally um, in quite a number of years. And there's been a a little bit of conversation around new stuff coming uh, in the pipeline. I know a few weeks ago um, we announced uh, globally to our shareholders that we had a new novel mode of action in the development pipeline. But even that chemistry, if it um, if it makes it through the um, the rigors of the regulatory process is still, you know, well over a decade away. So, um, you know, we're not uh, we're not anywhere as close to a new novel chemistry. And, you know, we certainly had lots of herbicides enter the marketplace uh, within each of these herbicide families. Um, certainly, the PPO inhibitors saw uh, products like sulfentrazone, flumioxazine added, um, safflafenacil from BSF. So. We continue to discover chemistries within each one of these families, but as far as a new novel way to kill weeds, we really haven't had one for quite a number of years. And that's really speaks to the challenges again that we have um, when we start losing tools at our disposal. Um, and really what in the herbicide world, a lot of the combinations that companies are coming out with today, premixes, copacs, are really trying to find um, different effective modes of action and what is old is new again. Uh, in the herbicide world predominantly. Just a couple trends uh, in, in Eastern and Western Canada. Uh, one of the biggest challenges obviously dealing with glyphosate resistance specifically is just the amount of tank mixing that happens. Um, you can see these slides are a season out of date, but we do have a, a trend towards a, a higher percentage both East and West uh, of adding a tank mix partner, um, but we still have a long ways to go and you know, Previously in our legacy Monsanto um, uh, company, we had our uh, effort to program uh, tank mix partners uh, with Roundup, uh, and we continue to do that today with our bare value uh, mix it up program um, in the marketplace. And we do have some some fairly uh, good herbicides available with some uh, programming dollars behind them, but you can see we do have a long ways to go. And certainly this trend is increasing as uh, the presence of glyphosate resistant weeds uh, increases as well. The next slide here just kind of depicts uh, the US marketplace and the timeline of uh, when Roundup Pretty traits were first introduced. And this is specific to the soybean market, but really you could translate this to, uh, to corn as well. So back in 1996, really when Roundup Ready beans were first introduced into the marketplace, you can see our group two chemistry was very extensively uh, used uh, in soybeans again, almost 50% of the of the revenue uh, coming from that single family. And then 1999, that was almost switched uh, fully by um, the use of glyphosate or Roundup. Uh, and you can see that trend continued to about 2007, um, when just about three quarters of the spend in the U.S. soybean business was uh, was just using Roundup or glyphosate. And you can see. The expenditure from growers continued to de decrease, right? Um, which, from a, a grower, when I put my farmer hat on, is uh, is a good thing for the bottom line. But then, when we start thinking about the challenges that we've had uh, with pigweeds and other resistant weeds since then, um, you can see the trend uh, upwards and the chemistry mix that is currently used. And again, this is updated to uh, 2016. I'm sure this pie chart would look a little bit different. Uh, today or after the 2019 season, but you can see, again, glyphosate uh, still utilized extensively. Uh, group twos here in red, our group 15s here occupy a, a significant um, portion of the marketplace as well. And that's really driven on um, controlling our, uh, our water hemp and palmer populations in the US. And you can see here with PPOs, again, uh, very effective or can be very effective on, on those amaranth species. So. You can see again this trend um, in the US marketplace and I expect if we did this similar analysis for Canada, we would see a similar trend, um, but probably pushed out to 2014, 2015. Um, and now it, it's likely going back the other way. So again, as resistance develops to glyphosate, um, it is very effective chemistry uh, and has been for a long time. And, um, and it was really, easy to just go in with uh, with two shots of Roundup um, and, and call it good. It controlled everything in your field, but um, you know, it's uh, it's challenging when uh, when we start dealing with resistance. And certainly there's uh, no chemistry out there that is uh, immune to um, developing some herbicide resistance. 
And one of the biggest tools that we have at our disposal is really around crop rotation. I think this is something that we do quite well uh, here north of the border, uh, you know, and certainly in most provinces and, and areas. Um, but when any time we can introduce a new crop into the rotation, uh, we give a, ourselves um, increased uh, diversity of herbicides that we can utilize and um, and also switch up the germination patterns and uh, and a few other things around weed populations. So this uh, picture here is fairly good to depict that. These are two fields in, in Essex County. This picture was taken back in 2010 when, first, when giant ragweed really first showed up uh, in growers fields to a, a broad extent. Uh, again, two no-till soybean fields in Essex County. Um, the grower on the right, this is all glyphosate resistant giant ragweed in his field, was uh, was continuous so soybeans for numerous years, no tillage uh, utilized, no crop rotation, and, and only used um, glyphosate or Roundup in that scenario. Whereas the grower on the right hand side uh, followed a, a fairly re regimented three crop rotation with corn, soybeans, wheat, utilized uh, other chemistries uh, outside of um, outside of Roundup in two of those three seasons, I believe. And you can see the difference just in that management um, practice. So, you know, it can be overwhelming if you're a grower in this situation. Um, certainly we've seen a lot of this um, as growers have figured out how to manage giant ragweed, but with Canada fleabane now, um, you know, it can certainly be overwhelming, but that's when we, uh, we need to start doing our homework um, and try to get on top of it as quick as we can. So getting down to uh, more specific on, on the weeds that we deal with here in Canada, um, obviously kochia is very dominant uh, weed in Western Canada, has been for many years um, in all crop rotations. Uh, first developed or identified resistance, I believe in 2012 or 2014, um, and it has continued to spread in, in through Western Canada. Giant ragweed was the first one that showed up on our doorstep. Um, I remember the first time I went to see the first field that was identified. Uh, it was right on the Windsor Airport site. Uh, the grower was locked into a soybean rotation uh, because it was right beside the runway. Um, only utilized uh, Roundup or Glyphosate for over a decade. This weed uh, biotype developed resistance and, and took off and it was quite um, interesting to see that situation. Canada fleabane. Again, I believe showed up around 2010 in Ontario, and it's uh, very prone to developing uh, a large distribution pattern. Has managed to um, spread across most of Ontario, and uh, and starting into Quebec, and certainly very prevalent all through the U.S. as well. Common ragweed um, showed up again in Essex County uh, near Windsor, Ontario. This population um, I thought would expand quite a bit quicker than what it has, um, but we really haven't seen common ragweed expand um, very much. And I think part of that is the um, the fitness penalty that that resistance population has. It just doesn't seem to produce um, as much seed and it's not nearly as aggressive as uh, its susceptible biotypes. So I think that one, um, you know, it's still here and there uh, down in Essex County, but really hasn't been a focus for many growers. And then the latest one to show up, uh, I think in 2014 was the first year we, um, Peter Sekma got a call on it, is uh, water hemp. And that's the one that I'm most concerned about uh, going forward. And certainly it's um, our next challenge uh, relative uh, with Palmer Amaranth. So again, I'll focus a few comments around kosher water hemp and flea bean um, for the rest of this presentation. But at the end, if anybody has any questions on common or giant ragweed, I can certainly field them as well. So looking at kochia specifically, um, it was first identified in 2012 in, in Alberta during the provincial weed surveys and, and certainly something that was on everybody's radar for quite a number of years. Um, and where it was first found is really uh, historically a, a fairly strong uh, fallow, um, chem fallow rotation, um, dry land scenario. So a lot of use of uh, glyphosate or Roundup over the years, um, perhaps not a lot of diversity in uh, what tank mixes were being used and, and the weed did develop there. So you can see in 2012, just a few populations identified uh, in red there as resistant, lots identified as susceptible. But when the survey was reconducted in 2017, you can see the amount of um, uh, resistance that, that spread fairly quick. And you can see uh, the difference, uh, different mode of action as well. So you got group two plus glyphosate and orange, uh, group two plus 
uh, group four in blue, and then the three-way resistant population to two, four, nine in green. So certainly this uh, this weed is a tumbleweed. It's very prone to moving very quick. Um, and those are the, that are dealing with it is uh, it's pretty obvious when there's a problem. So um, again, that's Alberta. Saskatchewan identified in 2013 during the provincial survey. Um, I believe the survey was completed last year and I'm sure uh, folks at Ag Canada are just screening that population now. Um, but I would expect this map to look very similar to what Alberta did on the previous slide. And then in 2013 in Manitoba, you can see two populations uh, confirmed with moderate levels of resistance. In 2018, you can see how much that has uh, increased um, uh, moderate and high level resistance. So again, that kind of relates back to the picture I showed uh, a few slides ago um, in the greenhouse during those uh, screening uh, flats, so those populations where some may have one survivor, some may have 100% of the seed or plant survive and, and everything in between. So certainly, um, the amount of selection pressure that uh, that you apply on those fields and in those situations has a big uh, driver on the uh, level of resistance in those populations. So um, I would say once you're certainly at that moderate to high level resistance, depending on the weed species um, and its ability to uh, to develop in the seed bank and longevity, you know you're really in for a, a career long challenge um, to deal with that weed and. Kosha is one of those weeds that it's been identified to not have a long seed life, which is uh, both good and bad. Um, and there is a little bit of debate in the literature around that. But if a weed has a, a short shelf life in the soil, um, you get a high percentage of that population germinate year in and year out. Uh, whereas you have something like water hemp that can stick around for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, that seed is uh, more prone to cause challenges uh, season long. So with respect to soybeans, um, last year we have done quite a bit of work over time uh, around kosher, but last year I ran another protocol uh, focused on a few tank mix partners, um, thinking about uh, our extend soybean system uh, that, that is in Western Canada. Um, you can see here Roundup by itself, there are quite a few kosher escapes. Low rate Roundup extend cleaned out a few of them, um, but again, not enough chemistry there. When we look at the mid rate, you can see a nice rate response in the, the amount of weeds in general in those plots. Um, and at the high rate, the two liter per acre rate, you can see pretty much clean the kosher out. Um, but again, growers that are in this situation, uh, relying on one effective mode of action um, is, a, is a short term game and something that needs to be thought about from long term sustainability and, and incorporating other uh, modes of action. So. One chemistry that uh, is obviously in the bear camp around Metribuzin or Suncor, uh, an older chemistry that's, you know, hasn't been utilized a lot um, in soybean production, a little bit in lentils and, and potatoes in the West. Um, but we do see nice um, activity with the dicamba group five uh, chemistry there on uh, not just the kosher, but also all the other weeds or most of the other broadleaf weeds uh, in this um, trial area. When we look at a couple options from the new farm camp, uh, Roundup Extend plus Volterra, so straight flumioxazin, again, very sharp on kosher in particular. And when we stack the flumioxazin with pyroxysulfone with Fierce, again, very clean treatment here. Um, in all the locations we had, uh, this treatment was uh, exceptionally uh, clean. So again, from a stewardship standpoint, weed efficacy wise, this um, this treatment here, is a, a very effective treatment. And obviously the question around cost uh, comes up um, in any of these conversations when we start talking about tank mix partners. And certainly economics does have a, a big driver in the decisions that we make as farmers. But um, when we're dealing with challenging weeds like this, um, I think we have to reset our expectations around what, uh, what the economics look like. And then from the FMC camp, so um, self enters owner straight up authority again looks very good and then authority supreme looks uh, looks good as well so again there's a couple of good options uh in soybeans um to tank mix with our dicamba based products um you know another good product from a burn down standpoint is south with Fenacil, another group uh, 14 or heat heat complete from the bsf camp so there are um there are options uh, in both roundup ready and uh, and extend soybeans uh, for western canada and just one slide on the corn front, again, um, 
similar chemistry from a pre standpoint. Uh, group 14 uh, heat, heat complete, uh, Volterra Fierce, or Roundup Extend, Extendamax. And then in the post emerge uh, corn uh, market, Armazon, again, a group 27, um, Topramazon, I believe, um, very common herbicide in Western Canada in corn uh, from BSF. Uh, activity by itself, but likely better activity with atrazine. I put Shield X in here, that's a new chemistry. Uh, group 27 topyrolate, I believe it was introduced commercially last year across Canada. And it's, um, I guess, claimed to fame as water hemp management. Um, they don't have kosha on the label uh, yet, but I'm assuming and uh, that they will uh, develop that because group 27s are quite effective. Uh, Bromoxanil or partner plus atrazine, again, another option from, uh, from our camp. Um, and dicamba as well uh, from that post-emerge standpoint. I put a comment in here more on the way, most likely. Um, certainly as we see uh, weeds like kosher develop and uh, water hemp coming to the marketplace and the corn acreage expanding, um, I expect that there will be quite a bit more activity around bringing herbicide options to uh, certainly Manitoba and the Red River Valley to help deal with these weeds. So. Um, not sure exactly what that'll look like, um, but I'm sure um, some of the chemistries that we have at our disposal in Eastern Canada will likely make their way west um, here in the next few years. So that's uh, what I wanted to cover on kosher. And if there's any additional questions, we can uh, hit on them at the end. <clears throat> the next weed that I'll jump into is uh, Canada fleabane. Um, <clears throat> again, this one showed up in, uh, I guess in 2006, 10, uh, right down here in Essex County. Um, I first saw it in a research trial in 2009 and it's spread uh, quite dramatically uh, very quickly across Ontario. And this map is obviously a few years out of date from Peter Sycamore. Uh, most of these counties would be light, lit up now. Um, survey work is, is essentially finished on this weed because it's <clears throat> essentially found just about everywhere. Um, again, a windblown seed. Uh, and the challenge with this one is you can do everything right in your own field uh, during the growing season. And if you have a neighbor or, you know, a farm 10 miles away that has an infestation, uh, that weed seed can blow um, certainly in, in the fall at harvest time um, around and, and um, set up shop in quite a few other fields. So, um, again, it's what I call a community weed. Um, you really need a community-based approach to managing it. You know, it's one that I don't think will ever fully eradicate, and it's one that's going to be a challenge for us year in and year out, just with its ability to spread and um, ability to find its way into our fence rows, ditch banks, roadsides, and produce seed. Um, we're really going to have a constant uh, seed source on this one. And really, uh, this is a slide that I borrowed from Peter Sycama. Um, the tank mix that works quite well in Roundup Ready IP soybeans is Aragon plus Metribuzum. So. Um, that is the most consistent tank mix that Peter's um, that Peter's found, and he's been doing work on this wheat in particular um, since that 2010 growing season. So a long history of uh, of looking at different herbicide combinations. But again, this is his been his most consistent from a, a Roundup Ready or IP standpoint. And Metribuzin is you know found in numerous uh, premixes and tank mixes in the marketplace um, with other modes of action. But again. From a conventional Roundup Ready or IP system, this is really the best one to uh, to go with. Um, and as far as post-emerge tank mix options, uh, Fort Canada flea bane control um, in conventional or Roundup Ready scenario, there's really none uh, available to us. Uh, first rate uh, historically has been very sharp on uh, on Canada flea bane, um, but again, uh, most populations are also group two resistant as well. So it eliminates that option from our toolbox. With the extend crop system, um, you know, we have seen a strong gravitation to utilizing dicamba uh, with extend soybeans, and it does work quite effectively. You can see here, high rate extendamax, um, you know, very good control. Um, but again, growers that have utilized the extend crop system, um, you know, have relied on dicamba heavily within that system, but we also need to think about other um, effective modes of action to tank mix with uh, with dicamb in that scenario. And Peter has a nice slide here that really shows us why, um, you know, control plant here, 
And when we apply uh, in this scenario Roundup Extend, you can see the growing point of this Canada flea bean plant was, was killed. And you can see the branching that happened uh, in regrowth after the fact. So, you know, dicamba is very effective. Our long-term data story would be mid-90s from a level of control. But when you have uh, potentially a few thousand plants per uh, square meter in the most extreme situations, mid-90s from a level of control is not sufficient. And, uh, and is also putting a, a lot of selection pressure on that chemistry. So again, thinking about tank mix partners, uh, the most important thing to do is start with um, the best foundation chemistry. So, you know, there's been quite a bit of 2,4-D uh, promoted in the marketplace for control of Canada flea bean uh, in Ontario, certainly available in numerous tank mixes and combinations, but starting off your program with 2,4-D isn't setting you up for the best chance for success. Um, whereas Dicamba uh, is the better uh, tank mix partner foundation uh, chemistry to use there. And thinking about other effective uh, tank mix partners, um, certainly in the BSF camp, the safflofenacil uh, based products, so Aragon, Integrity, Optil, um, do work quite effectively when tank mixed with, uh, with Dicamba, Extendamax, Roundup Extend, and, uh, and Ingenia from, from BSF. By fact, uh, Blackhawk, a couple of products from New Farm, uh, other metribuzin and based herbicides do give us another uh, effective mode of action in the tank on this particular weed. And on the corn side in, in Canada flea bean, I didn't put a slide up specifically uh, talking about that, but really <clears throat> the other effective mode of action, uh, one of the most, most effective modes of action for Canada flea bean control is tillage. Um, you know, whether it's primary tillage in the fall and secondary tillage in the spring or uh, cultivator disc pass in the spring. Um, a lot of our corn is uh, <clears throat> still grown conventional till uh, here in Ontario and Quebec. Um, there's quite a bit more ad adoption of strip till, which may change the scenario a bit. But I mean, our group 27 chemistry um, is very effective on flea bean. Uh, there's numerous options there uh, for both pre emergent crops. So not too worried about Canada flea bean control in corn. Um, it's more soybeans and, uh, and cereals where it's more of a challenge. Um, and again, um, it has been a challenge for us for quite a number of years and, and will continue to do so. And the last weed uh, that I'll talk about specifically <coughs> is, um, is one that worries me uh, quite a bit, uh, glyphosate resistant water hemp. This weed first showed up on Walpool Island in 2014, and this is a nice overhead picture from one of Peter Sycamore's grad students, James Ferrier, who works with New Farm. Um, a really nice overhead picture. So Peter has this trial location for numerous years now. He has corn on the left-hand side here, or sorry, soybeans on the left-hand side, corn on the right-hand side in this uh, picture, and he rotates these uh, trial blocks year in and year out. But you can see anything here in yellow is, um, is water hemp. And uh, you can see some of the densities in these fields or in these plots uh, where water hemp is a challenge. But you can see, you know, obviously don't know what each one of these plots is in particular, but there are quite a few options that Peter's done uh, quite a bit of good work on uh, with his grad student and technicians to help uh, give us some options here in Ontario. So water hemp in Ontario, this is a map um, that was developed, I think in February, it was shared on social media. Um, from Peter and, and quite a few other academics, uh, both in Ontario and Quebec, um, and really shows the diversity of what we're dealing with. So counties in red are four-way resistant, so group two, five, nine, and 14. Um, so again, not having much exposure to those chemistries uh, locally, um, those populations were more, more than likely brought up from the US uh, with equipment uh, movement or bird travel. Um, but you can see how quickly the population has spread. 259, um, you know, 2914, uh, 2 and 9, and, and 2 and 14. So a very diverse um, population that we have here in Ontario. And from 2014 to 2019, essentially, you can see the distribution that it has um, spread here across Ontario. And, you know, I think a lot of it is equipment movement, um, you know, bringing equipment up from the U.S. and, and not having it cleaned out. Um, again, potentially bird traffic and, and a few other things. And I, I 
titled this uh, map the weed that unites us all so regardless of which um, area of the country you're in uh, this weed is going to be a significant challenge for us uh, going forward um, you know first identified in a big way uh, in 2019 in Manitoba um, Tammy Jones provincial weed specialist there spent her summer uh, identifying water hemp populations um, in quite a number of fields and, and you can see the counties lit up there uh, we just reviewed the situation in Ontario and then the situation in Quebec um, my understanding is the first county lit up here um, was I think in 2015 or 16 when it was first identified uh, from a grower that brought a combine up that had some weed seed in it and then you can see uh, obviously uh, either that same population has moved or or other populations have set up shop and it's um it's going to continue to spread it's been on our borders for quite a number of years in the u.s and and it is i would say either the biggest weed challenge in the u.s or the second biggest depending on what um what area of the country you're in um and when i drove to uh farm progress show last year uh, down in in illinois um every prevent plant field that we passed had water hemp and canada fleabane uh, plants growing in it so it is uh certainly uh, spread fairly well throughout the U.S. and, and has driven um, growers herbicide practices extensively and I think we're just on the cusp of that happening uh, here in Ontario and uh, in Manitoba and Quebec as well so again that's why it, uh, it concerns me quite a bit. So the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges is just identifying water hemp. Uh, it is an amaranth or a pigweed part of the pigweed family um, you know, red root pigweed, I think most of us can identify from doing the 50 mile an hour crop tour. Um, but when we look at water hemp, you can see very similar leaf structure. But one thing I noticed with water hemp, it has a much waxier appearance to the leaf. Um, so once you do train your eye to identify it, it is um, easier to pick out of a crowd. But the biggest differentiator is uh, is the hairs on the stem. So red root pigweed or other pigweed species will have hairs uh, on the stems, petioles, leaves, uh, whereas water hemp is completely hairless on uh, on both the, lem the stem and the leaf um, surface. So that is uh, the easiest way to identify. Um, you know, sometimes uh, red root pigweed can have a lot of hairs, as in this picture, and other times it'll be very um, I guess a little bit more sparse, whereas water hemp is, is completely smooth. So that is uh, probably the key uh, distinguisher between the two. Um, and I would say one of the challenges with water hemp in particular is it's going to be, um, you know, a couple, three years before a grower has uh, a high enough population to pay attention to. Um, it may go misidentified as just a, a pigweed species that may be emerged later after herbicide application. And around emergence pattern, um, one thing unique with water hemp and palmer and, and other pigweeds is they can germinate essentially season long. So this picture or this graph here depicts um, plants per meter squared that germinated uh, from June 1st to October 25th. Uh, Peter had his grad students out every week, took the same uh, same square meter, pulled all the plants out that germinated and counted them up. And you can see the emergence pattern on this weed is tremendous um, and that is why it is a, a season-long control program uh, both pre-emerge post-emerge in crop and, and also after weed harvest um, in it, late into the fall and again it um, even those late emerging plants they don't necessarily get as tall or aggressive but they can still set seed uh, fairly aggressively in this picture here I took last summer um, I think we toured this location middle of August and you can see you know this weed's probably four-ish inches tall and it's got a fully formed seed head there and um, takes about two weeks from uh, seed head development to having uh, viable seed uh, within that seed head um, to uh, prop propagate um, so even those plants that emerge uh, well into the fall will be driven to produce seed and, and continue to be a challenge so some chemistry options uh, for corn um, in particular here. So this will be from a pre-emerge standpoint and regardless of which crop you're in, uh, especially with water hemp, it needs to be a plan to pass approach um, with uh, residuals utilized at both application timings. Um, you know, with kochia, fleabane, if you do a really effective job and you're burned down, you're 
likely past the bulk of those uh, those weeds um, causing you problems. But with water hemp, again, it's going to continue to emerge throughout the season, and uh, and the use of residual chemistry is going to be uh, very important going forward. So you can see here, uh, these are common trade names for different chemistries um, and the percent level of control. Um, you know, the control defined by PMRA is around 80%. Um, which really isn't commercially acceptable um, for most growers today. You really need to be in that 90, 90 plus range to uh, to look uh, from a, a weed control standpoint to be comfortable with what you're dealing with. So you can see um, Callisto, Converge, uh, Lumax, Acuron all have uh, group 27 chemistry in them. You can see tank mix with atrazine. Um, Acuron has uh, group 15 a pair of group 27s plus atrazine. Um, there's also group 15 here in Lumax and Integrity. So it's really a, a group 27, 15, 5 combination uh, that is most effective pre-emerge uh, in the corn system. Um, and then post-emerge, um, again, Dicamba group 4 uh, works well. Uh, 27 in Armazon plus atrazine, 24D works well as, as well. Marksman, atrazine plus dicamba, and then you can see another group 27, callisto plus atrazine. So again, when these were applied, um, either pre or post, nothing really gave us um, that high level uh, of control. And that's really where we need to focus on a pre, or sorry, a, a two pass, plan two pass approach. Um, so again, a full pre-emerge program uh, followed by an in-crop residual chemistry uh, to help uh, drive that to a closer to 100% control uh, in our corn systems. From a soybean standpoint, um, you know, Peter screened the most chemistry available to us here in Canada. Um, and you can see uh, from boundary up to fierce, the level of control, uh, this would be pre-applied pre uh, season long residual ratings. Um, you can see taken out 84 days. So I think that's seven weeks after application, um, sorry quite a bit longer that's uh yeah 10 12 weeks after application i guess um fierce again from new farm camp the best uh, residual chemistry we have there with flumioxazin and peroxisulfone triactor is a three-way mix from new farm straight metribuzin did fairly well um authority supreme sulfendrazone uh, straight flumioxazin so really the combination here is group 14 group 15 chemistry and uh, in group five chemistry in these combinations. But again, we don't see um, from this standpoint uh, a good level of control uh, season long. We still need to follow these up with another uh, chemistry. And, and really uh, from an extend crop system standpoint, um, you know, our recommendation will be uh, following up those residuals with an early in crop application of dicamba. So you can see Zidua, Authority Supreme, Boundary and Fierce, um, you know, we do pick up activity uh, and obviously it's better to start yourself off uh, with the best option. So um, again, the plan two pass program gets us close to 100% control. And uh, and this is really what it looks like in the field. So one tree to check, fierce pre followed by high rate roundup extend early in crop. Um, you know, very clean plot here, uh, fairly consistent. Um, <clears throat> but again, uh, in crop options, especially if we have uh, resistance to the group 14s, the reflex blazers of the world, um, you know, we're quite limited on our in crop options um, unless we're in the Liberty Link system or an extend system. So it, um, again, another very challenging weed. And one thing that this picture here highlights quite well and something I think has driven some of the US challenges just around row width. So one of the best tools in our, at our disposal is row width um, in both corn and soybeans. And um, you can see these 30 inch rows plant, uh, later in season still aren't canopied. So still allowing light to penetrate that soil surface and encourage germination. But if these were seven and a half or 15 inch rows, our wheat control window um, shortens up quite dramatically. So uh, that's another uh, excellent tool at our disposal. So how is this weed moving around? Again, I mentioned a few uh, topics here, um, you know, repair shop or equipment moving. Uh, this picture is just outside of Wallace Town, obviously a combine started in this field and you can see the distribution that came out the back end. Question around tillage mark, uh, equipment, anytime we have um, soil left on our on our cultivator or other pieces of tillage, those seeds can move around. 
Uh, flooding, it is called water hemp for a good reason. Um, it will, seed will flow with water. Um, and we have seen some populations emerge uh, close to waterways. Um, migratory birds is another question mark. Um, you know, it's been proven that that seed will survive in the, in the gut of a, a, a bird. Um, so if we think about migratory bird patterns from the southern U.S. up to our part of the world, um, potentially some of those populations came uh, came in that situation. Um, and again, what is our next challenge going to be? So water hemp is, is definitely a major challenge uh, today for the growers that are impacted and, and will continue to spread. Um, and I'm hopeful that it, as an industry, we can slow it down as much as we can. But the next one on the doorstep uh, in Michigan and North Dakota and a few other uh, geographies is Palmer Amaranth. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's somewhere in Canada already and we just haven't identified it. It usually takes two or three years to show up. Uh, after it shows up for us to identify it. And what uh, what concerns me with Palmer is both of these situations or populations were planted on the same day um, in a greenhouse. I took these pictures from St. Louis last year and you can see the amount of growth difference between Palmer and, uh, and water hemp. So again, both are dioecious weeds, out, uh, big outcrossers, lots of genetic diversity and uh, and leads to resistance developing fairly quick. So <clears throat> again, um, you know, we'll digest water hemp as it comes and, um, and Palmer I expect to be uh, shortly there behind it. Just a, a couple comments around trait pipelines. So, you know, obviously um, as Bayer Legacy Monsanto, we've, we've spent a lot of effort uh, with our uh, both herbicide and insecticide trait platforms and the and the market is becoming more diversity, which is a good thing um, and allows or gives more growers uh, uh, more diverse uh, tools in their toolbox. So this picture here from a trial in the US, um, you know, depicts extend soybeans. Extend flex soybeans is gonna be our next trait into the marketplace here. <coughs> Excuse me, um, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of years. Enlist was just um, introduced into the marketplace, I think, for 2020 growing season, and uh, and in the U.S. Liberty Link G27. So, again, the G27 is um, tolerant to uh, HPPDs, uh, Blue Phosphate or Liberty, and Roundup. Enlist is uh, 2,4-D Roundup and Liberty. Extend Flex is Liberty plus Dicamba and Roundup, and and Extend Soybeans is just Roundup and Dicamba. So you can see we are um, entering a, a place where we'll have numerous trade options available to us and it's really about picking the right one uh, that fits uh, your unique field situation and, and weed uh, challenge. And just uh, looking out a bit further, so again mentioned extend flex soybeans by adding uh, glufosinate on our extend platform. Uh, we do have fourth and fifth generation traits um, in the marketplace um, or not in the marketplace in development. So again Stacking in HPPDs and 2,4-D uh, with our fourth generation, and uh, and PPO with our fifth generation. So, again, we're not adding new novel modes of action from a tolerance standpoint, but mix, trying our best to um, mix and match chemistry options for uh, for the challenges that uh, that lie ahead. Um, and our corn pipeline looks very similar as far as uh, modes of action um, that we have. So, again. The marketplace is going to get busy, has gotten a lot busier, and um, and as our uh, weed challenges continue to evolve, um, you know, ourselves and lots of other companies are doing our best to stay ahead of the curve. So last section here, um, you know, what uh, uh, resources are available to us? So Manage Resistance Now is a, a crop life initiative. Um, Lots of good resources there around herbicide, insecticide, and fungicide resistance. Um, you know, they launched their campaign a couple of years ago. There is a website um, that you can go to for information. Uh, really good resources there. In Ontario, uh, Mike Cobra, our provincial specialist, has uh, done a great job to lead this project, but trying to uh, visualize all the um, herbicide resistance testing uh, over the years and, and put it into a map format. Um, so we can have an idea of what weed populations exist where, um, not specific to glyphosate, but really uh, all uh, species and, and modes of action. You can see uh, lots of testing even back to the late 80s. Uh, Francois Tardif at University of Guelph leads a lot of this effort. Um, 
So again, trying to visualize that in Ontario, make it more user friendly. A new um, project or effort and very collaborative effort between OMAF Ag Canada, University of Guelph and, and really uh, utilized in Ontario, Quebec and Manitoba is a quick test for um, identifying genetic markers within the weeds. So this is not one I'm quite excited about. Instead of spraying a weed, um, waiting for it not to die and then letting it go to seed and, and cause problems into the future, I think this uh, is potentially an opportunity where you can grab a leaf sample, send it away to a lab, they'll do a quick uh, confirmation on the genetic makeup of that weed and what uh, potential markers it has for herbicide resistance and, and hopefully be able to give you um, the real time or in season uh, confirmation of what it is and, and hopefully uh, some management options around that. So this one again is, uh, is being developed. Um, it's been a, quite a few years in the works and it's uh, a very good example of quite a strong collaborative effort in our academic community here in Canada. Um, so we'll see where that one evolves to. From our camps to our mixed up platform. Um, so again, our mixed up platform is, is kind of our umbrella brand for uh, all things uh, resistance focused. Um, uh, Legacy Monsanto, we had Monsanto Crop Management Solutions, uh, which has been rolled into this platform. So. There is quite a bit of information available. Um, again, I mentioned earlier about our marketing programs around bare value and uh, and having some key tank mix options in there for the challenges that we have today. Um, so I do encourage you to uh, to utilize those resources and, and have a, a look at that website. In the last uh, slide here as I finish up, just around some final thoughts. So <clears throat> herbicide resistance doesn't necessarily drive our management decisions yet. Um, certainly everybody's in a different spot as far as their uh, personal operations, but um, you know, one day it potentially will. And I would say Canada is still a yield first market where we're not making concessions uh, on what we're growing or the crop rotations that we have um, at our disposal uh, to focus on uh, herbicide resistance management. But um, I think with water hemp spreading fairly quick that um, that's going to really drive our herbicide patterns here in the new near future. Um, you know, the next one there is how do we change our culture of pushing the easy button? So I mentioned, um, you know, and it's grower behavior, I guess, human behavior to, to sometimes or most of the time take the easy button. It is, um, you know, challenging to look at your balance sheet and, and look at that extra spend for adding another effective mode of action to the tank. But from a long term sustainability, is um is really where we need to move to uh from away from short term economics so again that's uh, to me the challenge um we've spent a lot of time talking about this topic uh you know really back to the 80s um before my time um you know we are moving the needle um but our challenges i think are are quickly outstripping our our options or potentially outstripping our options and what are the other options we have at our disposal so um was one of the pre-questions that came in, but you know, certainly from an integrated weed management standpoint, I touched on crop rotation as being very effective tillage, um, depending on the weed you're dealing with. You know, there has been quite a bit of good work done uh, by some academics, uh, grad student projects around cover crops. I would say the most recent one, um, cereal rye utilized um, uh, fall planted to slow down Canada flea bane uh, establishment. Um, you know, there's certainly some good results there. The weed zapper, um, a bit of a new technology. Some of you may have not have heard of it. Um, there is a grower in my neighborhood, an organic farmer, that bought one of these last year. And essentially, what it is is a uh, a generator on the back of a tractor, PTO driven, um, essentially energizes a a bar here at the front, and it shoots. Basically, the um, the plant becomes the conductor, and it it shoots electricity through that plant um, and burns out the vascular tissue. So, you know, this was developed in the U.S., southern U.S., where they have big challenges with Palmer and water hemp. And I think, um, you know, this one in particular, I can see having quite a quite a bit of uh, functionality um, in those situations where where really you're up against the wall, and it's either this or something like hand weeding. Um, in those scenarios. And then the last one, just around the seed terminator, uh, this technology I think was started in Australia. Uh, there is some good work being done 
in Western Canada looking at this, uh, working with uh, Ag Canada, uh, Brands Heidemann and, and growers out there. But this one essentially separates the chaff um, coming out of the combine from the straw and puts that chaff through a hammer mill to uh, basically grind up any weed seeds that went through that combine. Certainly has some good ap applicability for certain weed species, not everything, um, but weeds that hang onto their seeds uh, right through till harvest and we can get with uh, with combine head. I think this has had some applicability and certainly um, has uh, quite, a, quite a decent foothold in Australia. So, so I think with that, um, that's what I wanted to cover today. I talked, uh, felt like I talked a mile a minute, but hopefully um, some of that uh, resonated with you um, and picked up a couple uh, quick tips there. Um, and certainly uh, we'll open it up for questions here, but if you have any specific questions, you can see my contact info there, my email, phone number, and my Twitter handle. Um, I am fairly active on social media, so if you want to get a hold of me, that's probably the best way. Um, and I think with that, Michelle, we'll open it up for questions. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam, for the great presentation. Um, we've got a handful of questions here, so we'll just kind of dive in. Um, first off, um, I'm in Manitoba, so I am in, interested in that increasing spread of, you know, water hemp and kosher here, of course. But can you touch on just how important the residual chemistries are going to be? And um, what's the impact on carryover concerns? <clears throat> yeah, and that's something um, that certainly I think about a lot um, and lots of other companies and, and folks do. But in Western Canada, you know, with potentially limited rainfall, certainly last few years, very limited rainfall in, in most of the geography, um, cool soils, frozen conditions most of the year, quite a bit of the year. Um, you know, breakdown of residual chemistries can be hampered or slowed down. But I would say, you know, as we move into the space, especially with water hemp, where um, the use of residual chemistry is going to be very important to stay ahead of that weed and, and do our best to combat it. I think we're going to have to get better and maybe a little bit more flexible in our crop rotations and considering, um, you know, how to make corn, soy, uh, cereals, canola, dry beans work together in a rotation. Um, you know, certainly economics, crop prices drive uh, drive what we plant in our fields each year. But when we start dealing with um, with weeds like water hemp, it's probably going to shift that management level to worrying about what herbicides you're using to control that weed and, and what crop options you have to plant behind it. So. Um, It'll be interesting to see how that evolves over the next number of years, but our um, our ability to be flexible in what we're planting and recropping too. I know atrazine's used fairly extensively um, across Western Canada. It can certainly hamper canola uh, recrop. Um, you know, products like Group 27s uh, and others that uh, that are very effective on water hemp and have good kosher activity. Um, you know, may start to handcuff us from having uh, the flexibility that we want, but that's kind of where my thoughts are on that question. For sure, thanks. Um, can you quickly touch on, you know, how tillage can also be used to combat the three weeds you spoke about today? Yeah, I touched on briefly um, throughout, but a weed like Canada fleabane, I think a lot of us forget uh, or maybe don't don't appreciate is tillage is very effective on that weed. So uh, once fleabane sets its seed, you know, quite a high percentage of that seed germinates in the fall if conditions are right or in the springtime. Um, and fairly aggressive tillage, so something more aggressive than a, a light vertical tillage pass is um, can be quite effective at thinning that population out. Um, a weed like kochia uh, germinates super early in the spring. Um, you know, tillage can help uh, take out what's emerged and potentially, you know, some others will come in behind it, but initially, initial takedown of that weed. Um, but a plant like water hemp, tillage um, encourages germination to happen. Um, it's no different than any other pigweed species or warm uh, season annual broadleaf where, you know, we warm up the soil, soil, sun contacts the soil and it's kind of game on from a from a growth standpoint. So certainly tillage can help take out what's there, but it's gonna 
encourage more to to come on too so um may not be the best situation uh, for that weed in particular okay thanks got a couple audience questions here um jim's just curious about what about group three in soybeans as another mode of action yeah um i'll be honest that's one that i'm not overly familiar with um and one that has come up in conversation a little bit um I believe uh, if I'm thinking the proper active or chemistry be edge um, avidex, um, you know, those chemistries are making a comeback. Um, certainly wild oats uh, develop broad resistance to the group threes. Um, you know, now that those populations, group three resistant populations anyway, or maybe uh, disappeared a little bit from our seed banks, um, those chemistries are being more effective again, but yeah, certainly, um, Anything that we can have at our disposal, I think we need to consider. Um, but as far as specific activity, I'd have to dig into that a little bit further. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and just one last question before we wrap it up. Um, final thoughts on the long-term uh, global R&D pipeline and the ability to actually stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, and I touched on that a couple times in the presentation, but you know, it's, the challenge I think we have, especially in the herbicide world, is is trying to come up with combinations and products to keep us ahead of um, of weeds developing resistance. And you know, I always take it back to the fact that Mother Nature is very adaptable. Her job is to survive um, and adapt, and and she's very good at doing that. You know, our trait pipeline is going to be stacking um, you know numerous tolerances on the same traits, um, not new modes of action, but just giving growers um, the flexibility to use them potentially in different crops, uh, pre, post options. Um, but it's difficult to discover new chemistry and bring it to market. Um, you know, regulatory uh, regulatory tolerances around um, things like toxic, to toxicology or toxicity um, kill a lot of chemistry out of the gates. And, you know, I think the um, chemistry we uh, introduced a few months ago in our investor deck um, I think was the first mode of action unique mode of action that made it to the next phase of development in over 30 years from a bear standpoint so you know I think the R&D investment um, once glyphosate resistant weeds started showing up and are becoming more prevalent has ramped up from a discovery standpoint um, but we still need to be very aware and, and utilize the tools that we have at our disposal today to try and stay ahead of the curve, but um, you know, in the southern U.S., where you have six and seven-way re resistance to herbicides, I mean, some of those growers are resorting to roguing crews going out and hand pulling weeds um, in those situations. So, to me, that scares me a lot. Um, and as we move into this water hemp world with four-way resistance already here in Ontario and, and two and three-way in Quebec and Manitoba. Um, we're already well down the road of, uh, of having those same challenges. Right, okay, perfect. Thanks for expanding on that. Um, so we're gonna wrap this up for today, but if you have any further questions following the presentation, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll connect you with Adam, or you can see his contact information still on the screen there as well. Um, just a reminder that this webinar has been approved for one credit in crop management. So if you did not submit your CCA number when registering, please email your first and last name and CCA number to webinars at annexbusinessmedia.com. Uh, further instructions will also be found in our follow-up email, which will hold the recording of the webinar. Thanks again to you, Adam, and to all of our attendees for tuning in to today's webinar. Don't forget to visit topcropmanager.com slash webinars to view all of our previously recorded webinars and register for our third webinar of this series about cover crops happening on April 8th. One last special thanks to Mix It Up by Bayer Crop Science for sponsoring our session today. From seed to harvest, Bayer is focused on delivering top performing solutions to address some of your toughest farm challenges. Wishing you, your teams, and all of your families all of the best right now. Stay healthy and have a great rest of your day, everyone.